Good afternoon and welcome to another RSNA 3D printing special interest group webinar. I am Peter Leacourse, your current SIG chair and will be moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Utilizing 3D Printing, Mold Making and Casting for Medical Applications. Before we get started, for those of you who may not know, RSNA is the Radiological Society of North America. The mission of RSNA is to promote excellence in patient care and healthcare delivered through education, technological re research innovations. RSNA has over 52,000 members from over 153 countries around the globe. Within RSNA, we have the 3D Printing Special Interest Group, the SIG for short. This group was founded by Dr. Frank Rubicki in 2016 after three successful years of educational and hands-on sessions at the annual RSNA conference. The SIG's mission is to promote the highest quality 3D printing applied to medicine via education, collaboration, and research. The SIG will focus on maintaining a prominent role for the radiologists and other allied health professionals in this diverse and growing specialty. The group will also seek to provide physicians and allied health scientists with optimized education and research. Please visit the link below on this uh, slide if you would like to become a SIG member. I believe it is the diversity of our SIG members which make the SIG so special. We not only have the radiologists and physicists, but we also have the radiology technologists, engineers, scientists, educators, and industry members. I am proud to announce the SIG is in its fifth year and still making contributions to the field of medical 3D printing. Over the years, the SIG and SIGS member have been part of major efforts throughout the community. These efforts include publications on medical 3D printing guidelines and appropriateness for clinical scenarios, a joint meeting with the FDA, category three CPT codes, a medical 3D printing registry, along with having active work groups in quality assurance, regulatory, and education. The current SIG leadership includes Nicole Wake, who is our treasurer, Andy Christensen, who is our secretary, Adnan Sheik, who is our vice chair and myself as the chair. Radiology really gives us a centralized location within a hospital to house a 3D printing facility. 3D printing seems like a natural transition following 2D images and 3D re renderings. The role of SIG is diverse, spanning education, quality, registry, and reimbursement. Please use the link below to view our previous webinars. A lot of those have focused on 3D printing during COVID, our 3D printing registry, and billing using the category three CPT codes. This webinar today will look past the creation of anatomical models and radiological scans. We will start off with a basic discussion of mold making and casting, and then discuss how this can be applied to a hospital's 3D printing program. Each panelist will show several examples of how they utilize 3D printing to create molds and cast different materials for a variety of applications, including facial prostheses, surgical molds, bolus offsets, and simulators. Within these applications today, you'll see presented, you will see the lines blur between medicine, engineering, and artistry. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel. Myself, I am Peter Leacourse. I have a PhD in biomedical engineering, and I joined Walter Reed in 2006. I am the director of services for the 3D Medical Application Center, and there we apply uh, 3D technology and printing to make certain devices, which include medical models, guides, implants, prosthetics, and simulators. Juan Garcia, who is from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, received a Master's of Arts degree from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He's a currently Associate Professor in many departments. He is a certified clinical anoplastologist, and he does a lot of fascinating and intricate work with designing and manufacturing facial prosthetics. 
Sarah Flora, who is the program director for the Radiology 3D Lab at Geisinger. Uh, she is a registered X-ray and MR technologist. Sarah has a bachelor's degree in medical imaging and is currently enrolled in Penn State's uh, master's degree of additive, additive manufacturing and design. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Juan Garcia and he will begin the discussion with the basics of mold making and casting and then show us some of his examples. Thank you, Peter. Hopefully everyone can see the screen. Uh, this is my first time using WebEx, so forgive me if uh, it's a little bit bumpy. I'm very pleased to be a part of this panel and this discussion on mold making and casting in medical sculpture. So the objectives, I'm hoping to define mold making, casting, and the finishing phases of making medical models. I'm gonna be showing you various materials that could be used for both the mold making and the casting portions of the process. I'll be discussing with a very brief overview of various methods that are used for both mold making and casting. Uh, touch upon digital mold making using ZBrush, as well as discuss some 3D printing considerations. I have no conflicts of interest to report. And we'll begin here with this example of beautiful medical sculpture uh, that was created uh, back in the 1700s by Clemente Susini. Uh, these are anatomical wax models that would have been uh, sculpted above a lot of the uh, bony anatomy. Another example from historical uh, medical sculptures. Uh, this is a, an example of a French uh, work of uh, Azu, uh, would have been a little bit later uh, using a paper mache method. I thought this image was interesting because you see the molds that he would have been using in order to cast many of the pieces that he would assemble together in his workshop. So a little bit about workflows. I tend to think of it as uh, a dichotomy between traditional and digital workflows. For a traditional workflow, I'm starting off typically with an impression and then I'm sculpting a model. I could either start with the impression or I could just sculpt a model. Uh, with various materials, let's say wax or clay. Then I can make a mold, and then I can cast using that mold a positive. The mold represents a negative, cast represents a positive. And finally, I think of a finishing phase to the work in which I'm not getting a perfect item out of the casting. I need to do some additional uh, modifications to that cast in order to get to the final piece. In a digital workflow, on the other hand, I'm looking at uh, starting off either with a surface scan or I can segment DICOM data sets, or I can just start sculpting using a D, uh, 3D modeling or 3D digital sculpting software. I prefer the latter. Uh, the digital sculpting software of ZBrush is my medium for the sculpting phase. Uh, I have to then generate out what's called a watertight model, which many of us already know what that is, uh, that's ready for 3D printing. And then I can go ahead and if I wanted to, I could 3D print either a positive model for flexible mold making or rigid mold making, or I can also 3D print a negative mold of that item and then do traditional casting uh, using the 3D printed mold either in a rigid or in a flexible. So here are those examples of, let's say, direct sculpting using wax or clay. I can sculpt on top of an object. In this case, uh, some uh, elements were added on top of that to represent the ligaments, and then a mold could be made from that. I can also uh, use some impressions of either alginate, polyurethane, or silicone materials, and then subsequently cast something in that, uh, let's say in this case, clay that has been heated so that it is pourable. So the sculpting materials, here are some examples of a couple of them. 
uh, Amico carving wax. You can buy a one pound uh, uh, amount of this and go ahead and you start sculpting in a positive. Casting wax. Um, these are, this is a very good one to use uh, from Polytech. It has low shrinkage. Wax usually shrinks once it cools. Uh, this is a nice one because of that low shrinkage. Base plate wax, I typically use for some of the work that I do in facial prosthetics because uh, it's readily available. It's uh, used in the dental field. Uh, this has already like a pink tint to it, and I can modify that by just using different candle dyes. And then the techniques in working in wax, I'm usually utilizing heated tools. So I'm using dental carvers or wax carvers, and I'm usually using a heat source. I'd like to use something like this, which is a no flame heat source, an induction heater. Um, you could also use one of these that uh, heats up the tip of my sculpting instrument. For kind of the final phases of the sculpting, I may want to polish out and uh, burn out the wax, so I'll use these tools. A couple of the sculpting materials in clays, now we're getting into different uh, materials of oil-based or polymer clays, and then water-based clays. When I say clays, most people think water-based, uh, but typically what I'm utilizing is an oil-based clay. It's very important that I utilize a non-sulfur clay, uh, many of these oil-based clays contain sulfur. I want non-sulfur because I don't want to contaminate my silicone mold. It will uh, retard the, the setting of the silicone if I don't use a non-sulfur. These are some of the uh, types of clays that I use. I really like the Van Aken uh, because it is pourable. That was the example that I just showed you earlier. Uh, you can pour it into a mold. Let's talk a little bit about different mold making principles. So pour versus brush on versus a play, uh, spray application of a mold. So for pour, typically you have a retaining wall and you have your object that you're gonna make a mold of within that. In this case, it's an L-shaped bracket that is uh, held together here by these clips uh, so that it very readily creates like this box form. I can pour in the material in there. I can also use a brush and just brush it on. And I can also use a spray. So you could spray certain silicones. Uh, these are more for architectural type applications. Um, you can imagine that if you are pouring your silicone, you want something that is relatively uh, low viscosity, uh, something of a higher viscosity for things that you want to uh, stay on on a brushed application. The box mold, we already talked about that versus a cavity pour. So I'm pouring into a cavity here. Uh, this is the object that was, let's say, 3D printed, and we want to make a mold of that. So here I'm pouring into it. Uh, shells. Uh, support. Sometimes these flexible molds need to have a rigid piece onto which uh, it would allow me to then uh, cast something in without distorting the mold. And that's where you would use a support shell. This is an example of a support shell around a silicone mold that's been brushed on. Mechanical underlux and uh, spaces. So, so sometimes you will have an object Let's say the blue item here is the object that you wanted to make a mold of. The green represents the bottom part of that mold. The red represents the top part of that mold. It's a two-piece mold, one, two. This is, again, the object that we're trying to cast. You can see that a little shelf, that little amount of shelf there is going to end up locking in my top mold because of that. Uh, these undercuts can end up uh, effectively uh, making your molds unusable, especially if you're doing rigid mold making. For flexible mold making, these things can be overcome, but still there are in instances in which you can end up locking your piece 
if you're going right through, let's say like a donut hole in here, uh, and it doesn't have a parting line between the two sides. Release agents are very important, uh, sealants and release agents. A sealant seals the object from absorbing any of the material. A release agent allows it to uh, come off more readily. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, registration keys are important in multiple piece molds in that it allows us to register the different mold parts. Uh, fence and a shim. This is actually an example of a fence uh, or a shim uh, that essentially this is the flexible piece, a flexible mold that has been uh, painted on. And my fence allows me to have a parting line between the two parts. Uh, so this is made out of clay and I'm going to put a material up against that and that becomes my parting line to separate the various mold pieces. Venting and bleeding are two important things when casting. Uh, that allows air to escape, preventing air bubbles during the casting. Uh, this is an example down here of my vacuum degassing materials. Uh, so I use a desiccator chamber hooked up to a pump, and that allows me to uh, make a negative pressure environment where my silicone can end up degassing so that I don't incorporate bubbles into let's say a silicone uh, mold making material or uh, a silicone piece that I'm casting as a positive. By the way, these little sprues here, these are the venting channels that I was referring to earlier. So sealant release agents, there are various kinds. There are liquid, waxes, ointments, additives, sprays, soap suspensions that you can make yourself uh, using isopropyl alcohol, Mix one to one with Dawn soap. Uh, that essentially makes a release agent. Uh, the one that I tend to use for most applications actually is this one here, the polyester par film. Uh, you can get it from this company called Complete Sculptor. It allows for silicone to silicone separation as well as silicone to gypsum to epoxy. Um, so you can see that I've categorized these here, and hopefully you can come back to this presentation and get a sense for what it is that you want to use, uh, depending on the type of mold, as well as the type of casting material that you'll be using. Another one that I want to point out is Hyperfolic by SmoothOn, and I have a lot of the SmoothOn products here because they have a great website, a lot of variety of different types of materials. This one added to the body double allows you to release off of hair. There are some formulations of the body double uh, body impression material that already have this additive added into, in, into there, uh, but you may want to buy it separately. You need to know something about physical properties of materials when buying these materials. You can see here on the Smooth On website, I'm just telling it I'm looking for a silicone and it lists all the different product names and all of these characteristics that make each one different. And it's very important that you uh, know what these different uh, values mean. So the mix ratio means how many, how much part A to part B that has the catalyst uh, in order to have a reaction. One to one is the easiest because you can readily uh, measure that volumetrically. Pot life tells you how long you have after you've mixed the two part A and B before it becomes unworkable. Cure time will tell you uh, how much time you have until it is fully cured and know that there are different additives that you can add to the different materials uh, to either accelerate or retard that cure time. Heat, in essence, acts as an accelerator as well. Uh, but know that uh, when you're heating a mold-making material, you can also increase the porosity of that as your air bubbles uh, start to expand. Durometer tells you the hardness of the rubber. Uh, so typically for silicones, I'm using a Shore A value of uh, silicone. Uh, typically, I'm casting a lot of facial prosthetics. Skin has a 10 Shore A value of durometer. 
So it will give you a sense for the durometer hardness of the various materials that you're utilizing. If you're going very soft down to rubbers and gels, you're using a Shore 00, zero uh, as part of the durometer. So in this case, the EcoFlex Super Soft, that's in that 00, zero range. Viscosity tells you how well the material flows. It's measured in centipoles. Uh, the uh, thicker that it is, the higher the viscosity of that product. Water is the measure, the kind of standard of one centipodes. Uh, so this gives you kind of a guide of the different uh, viscosities. You should know that an additive can be added to increase the viscosity as well. These are called thixotropic, uh, thixotropic agents. Uh, tear strength, you should know the tear strength of the silicones that you're using if you're doing silicone work. Uh, it's, you should know that the softer that you get in the shore A, the uh, lower the tear strength will be on that silicone, typically. So flexible mold making impression materials include alginates. These are uh, different kinds of alginates. Uh, some can be uh, utilized with warmer water. Typically, alginates set faster with hot water. So you typically want to use cold water with alginates. Uh, polyurethane, sometimes you are casting silicone uh, into a mold, a flexible mold. And it's better to use a polyurethane mold because you will not get any bonding between silicone and polyurethane. It does not require degassing typically, especially this product, the Brush On 40. Um, you should not be using polyurethanes for life casting. This material is not skin safe. Uh, you should also know that it is uh, susceptible to uh, moisture sensitivity. So if you leave your part A uncapped, you may not be able to use it later on. Uh, I usually will use a blanketing gas in order to. Uh, let's say the, uh, the little spray on bottles for cleaning the keyboards. I'll spray a little bit of that and close it very quickly, and that will displace a lot of the moisture in there. Platinum silicones are typically used. Uh, I like to use the platinum silicones. Know that there are tin base cured. Um, these tin base uh, silicones are incompatible with platinum cure, meaning that they will not allow one another to cure when cast up against one another. If you are uh, doing live casting directly on the skin, you wanna use a skin safe uh, uh, silicone impression material. Body Double is a very popular one. They do come in a fast cure and a regular cure. Uh, the mold making silicones, depending on what your application is, you may want something that's very clear so that you can see your object through it. Um, this sort of clear is a nice one to use for that. You can see that it has a cure time of four hours. And the Rebound 25 is another one for these kind of flexible mold making applications. You see that it has a Shore A of 25, cure time of six hours. It does have a nice degree of elongation. As I mentioned before, uh, when you have a flexible mold, you sometimes want a rigid material up against it so that you don't distort the mold as you are trying to cast something. And there are different strategies for doing that. The simplest being plaster bandages can be used. And know that you can paint epoxy, a uh, five minute cure epoxy direct painted after the plaster bandage is cured. And you would not do that when you're doing a body impression. You would do that after it's been removed in order to make your plaster bandages more uh, resilient. Another strategy is to put fiberglass directly into the gypsum material uh, that you're gonna use for this uh, support shell. That makes a very strong, rigid support. Um, you can use uh, chopped fiberglass as well as a fabric fiberglass uh, in order to do that as well. Uh, there are fiber-filled resins that are trowelable. 
Uh, so you can use a spatula in order to uh, directly apply it onto the flexible mold. Plastic paste is a really nice one to use, as well as a brushable version. Um, this is shell shock. Um, I use these uh, shell shock and plastic paste in some of my uh, more creative applications. Mold making techniques. Let's talk a little bit about that. So initially, we want to seal the model that you're trying to make a mold of, then apply a release agent, then make your part A and B, apply a first coat, and then cover the entire model, leaving a flange. You want to repeat the process so that you end up building up your mold. Notice that they're utilizing different colors, uh, tinting the, in this case, the brush on 40 with these tints so that they can see as they are building up their mold that they have complete coverage. That's a nice strategy to use. Uh, at some point, you want to then remove all undercuts uh, because what you're going to do now is to then create a shim and then start using this, in this case, plastic paste in order to make your rigid uh, support shell. You can imagine that if you have undercuts, you can end up locking your rigid support shell onto the model and you would have to either break the support shell or the model in order to remove the uh, support shell. So once you have a mold, you're going to cast it and then you can go back to this list to figure out what it is that you want to use. If it's a gypsum, a good one to use is this hydrostone. It has very nice replication of fine details. Uh, I tend to use rigid uh, dental stones uh, for uh, dye stone applications uh, for my gypsum product. Uh, you can also use castable urethanes. This, these are very interesting materials. I highly recommend that you look at this Smooth Cast 300 by Smooth On. Uh, it's, uh, uh, let's think, uh, I would say like pancake syrup type consistency. Mix your A and B equally one to one. And in three minutes, you can see it already starting to gel up. And in 10 minutes, you can pull it out of the mold and it's a, a rigid piece. It comes in a bright white uh, color. It can be tinted using different pigments. Uh, there are different variations of that product. Um, one that is specifically designed for roto casting. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, brushable polyurethane. Um, so the shell shock, in addition to being used as a support mold, can be the positive. Uh, material. Uh, if you want a water clear polyurethane, this polyoptic is a really nice one to use. Uh, rigid urethane foams. So sometimes you want things in a positive, but you want it lightweight. So you would end up using these uh, foam products, depending on how uh, much of an expansion you want, you select either one of the two. And there are foams that are flexible. Uh, these are silicone foams. Uh, that could be used in order to create a flexible, lightweight product. Mold making and casting. So some examples of what a mold making uh, for ocular prosthetics as well as nasal prosthetics and some uh, training models as well as a foot prosthetic. You can see that I'm using this to create my uh, wall into which I can do uh, polyurethane in this case. Uh, and I'm painting it onto a silicone piece that I put down at the bottom here that's acting as my uh, shim, if you will. So casting techniques. I talked about roto casting. Basically, you're pouring your material into the cavity of the mold and then rotating it in order to cover all the areas. Uh, polyurethane can also be used for these brush-on type applications. Uh, so in this case, you're brushing it into this mold half, putting your two mold halves together, and then uh, pouring some more of that material and uh, rotating it in order to get a hollow material. If you wanted it to be solid, you can put in one of these expanding foams in it. 
or uh, some other like gypsum material. The foam is advantageous in that it's going to be more lightweight. And finally, silicone. This is the procedure that I use for making the facial prosthetics in which I'm mixing and degassing my materials. And then I'm painting it in. And you can paint in silicone in these multiple layers in order to achieve a high level of realism to the cast piece. Uh, typically, uh, if you're going for realism, you want a lot of hydro, uh, heterogeneity to that color, and that's how you obtain it. So, casting a little bit about casting. Um, so, casting can be in the form of this uh, melted clay, it could be in the form of a clear acrylic that you're putting in here for an ocular prosthesis. Um, it could be silicone, it could be these castable urethanes. And finally, uh, with modern workflows, we know that we can 3D print in either uh, non-biocompatible or biocompatible sterilizable materials. Uh, once we cast the piece, typically, or we are done with the 3D printing, there's a finishing phase to that. Um, for silicone work, typically you're using a burr like this that has a tooth to it so that you can burr out the seam lines of the molds. That's what's called a mollow color cutter. Um, you can paint, so you can paint your silicone either through suspending it, uh, suspending pigment in a volatile silicone fluid, and then sealing it. In this case, with a silpoxy, is a nice one to seal silicone painting with. Um, you can also, once you're painting with these, it ends up imparting too much gloss sometimes. So you can also add these. Uh, uh, dilutants to uh, go ahead and obtain either a matte or a glossy surface to that painting. Um, if you are casting in uh, castable polyurethane or polymer clay like the Sculpey's, uh, know that you can paint those. Typically you're using an uh, oil enamel or an acrylic paint. I'd like to use these testers paints. Uh, sometimes for the urethanes you may want to give it a uh, spray coat of polyurethane primers prior to, as well as perhaps uh, using it for sealing the paint afterwards. And finally, if you're doing a castable epoxy piece, the primary, uh, the primer that works best is a Zin uh, BIN primer. And any painting that you may want to do, you may want to consider using a formulation of 70% denatured alcohol to 30% of this shellac, and then uh, going ahead and uh, blend it. So finishing can be in the form of, in this case, this castable polyurethane piece that you're painting. Uh, it could be in the form of this piece that was cast from a 3D printed mold that then you had to cut away uh, the remnant uh, flashing, if you will, uh, from that mold. It could be in the form of painting the device in order to get to naturalistic skin tones. It could be in the form of buffing, polishing, or it could be in the form of putting some material on top of what's been cast, in this case, from a 3D printed mold in order to remove evidence of build line. I'll switch a little bit and talk about hybrid uh, workflow considerations in which, uh, in this case, uh, segmenting the data of a nose from CT data uh, using ZBrush in order to uh, go ahead and sculpt it. Obviously, we can 3D print it uh, on many different materials. Uh, for the prosthetic workflows, many times I'm going from that 3D print and then duplicating it using a, a mold that I would then cast in wax and then go through my traditional workflow steps, I find that that gives me better uh, end result of uh, the prosthetic device. Uh, you should also be aware that um, the ZBrush software that I'm mentioning is not a 510K cleared product. Uh, so certainly, depending on the application that you're using, it may not be appropriate. Uh, for the applications that I'm doing with these facial prosthetics is certainly uh, advisable to use uh, because it becomes a much more creative medium. Uh, here's an example of uh, 
how I'm using it in a creative manner. Uh, so this is uh, a CT scan. Uh, actually, I apologize. This is a surface scan that was done of the patient using an Artex scanner. And then I was uh, taking a scan of the patient with and without his old prosthesis and then uh, sculpting on that old prosthesis, which I felt was unacceptable, uh, a more realistic representation of what his nose uh, actually looked like. Uh, that can then be approved by the patient and then created into a surgical guide or surgical template, better said. Uh, these are some of uh, articles regarding that uh, that were published back in 2009 and 2008, actually 2006 and 2008, uh, where we were uh, starting to look at these workflows. Um, and again, uh, can also be used in this case for planning out where implants uh, need to be placed. And this is in collaboration with other software. Uh, where I can uh, do the pre-planning based on the CT data set and then generate out a 3D printed uh, sterilizable biocompatible surgical guide. I want to point out to you, uh, because I was unaware, uh, that Form Labs recently in May, I believe, uh, released their biomed uh, resins. I'm actually going to be participating with Form Labs to create a, a webinar regarding uh, some of the surgical guides, and they made me aware of these biomed uh, resins that are not for dental applications, but this is, let's say, a uh, homolog of the Form Labs Dental SG material, except that these um, are not necessarily tied to a dental application. And these are manufactured by Form Labs. I'm almost done. Can I just a couple more slides real quick? You have about one minute, Vaughn. Okay. Uh, this is an example of a trainer that was uh, 3D printed, and then we 3D printed some molds in order to create castable silicone pieces that insert into the sides. Uh, we also were casting using a brush-on application these vessels. Um, in the process right now of creating some uh, 3D printed molds, based on these uh, digital sculpts in order to cast out these silicone devices. And lastly, donor masks for facial aloe transplantation. The lead slides show taking an impression and then casting in silicone multiple layers, a uh, brushable rigid piece, and that can be put on a patient. And lastly, that was replicated as a 3D printed mold. And you can see the results here. Also, please note the times related to each one of these. Note that digital isn't always faster. Thank you. All right. Sorry, guys. I'll go through this a little quick here. Uh, Sarah Flora, Program Director of Geisinger's 3D Imaging and Printing Lab. Um, just a high-level overview of our, uh, our facility. We have 14 hospitals, three level one trauma centers, a med school, and our own health insurance plan. We started medical 3D printing back in 2015. Um, we have about five different buckets that our use cases are for, but I'm going to kind of talk about our molding for um, resident education and simulation. So we kind of start with a CT and segment out that anatomy and then print, um, print the molds, fill them with silicone or whatever kind of material we have, and then we kind of uh, center on more diagnostic uses. So if we want to do a CT or an MRI or ultrasound, what is that material going to look like? What is that mold going to look like after the fact? So there's some differences in molding versus 3D printing. Why don't we just 3D print these simulators? Um, a couple big things are there's not that great of material for 3D printing yet. I mean, there are some printers that can print a little more realistic materials, but it's going to cost you a decent amount of money. Um, Silicone is a lot cheaper as well, especially if you're thinking about um, like multiple models for simulation. You're not going to want to print every single one of those. But there are some, uh, you know, drawbacks to molding as well. You're going to have a lot more labor involved when you're when you're post processing and pouring and all of that good stuff. So, and it might be a little more complicated to try and embed materials into. So, you know, plus and minuses to both. 
We have four different print technologies. Uh, here, I tend to go with our binder jetting the most for mold making, just because it gives a nice matte finish. And we like to use um, hot glue guns and glue to go around our seams, so it's really temperature resistant. And then when you think about what you're gonna actually be casting with, uh, for us, at least we look at different buckets as far as if you're gonna be looking for a simulation model, you know, what kind of shore value or durometer of silicone or gelatin you're gonna use for that. But then in different retrospects, you gotta you have to make sure if you're gonna use it for X-ray or CT or MRI, what kind of materials you can use so that it shows up anatomically correct as well. We use a lot of smooth on products as well, just like uh, Juan said. So I usually go off of these kind of charts for hardness or shore value. Pot life is how long you have to work with something and then cure time is how long until you can completely remove that model from the mold itself. So out of those three things, you can kind of find the material that you need that's closest to it. We've used gelatin in the past as well as some acrylics. Segmentation is pretty similar to if you're gonna segment 3D anatomy um, for printing. So you're gonna segment each, each part, in this case, that lower leg wound. It was uh, the bones, muscle, fat, and skin that were segmented. And then design, you're still gonna make sure all of your parts are sound for printing, even though you're not printing those parts, the negative of that is gonna be printed. So you wanna make sure these models are sound and um, the mold will print correctly as well. And this is just going through some of the contours of these parts. And then we use two different uh, designing you know, applications to create these molds. So you can basically just put a box or something around that part and subtract out um, your original part and then you'll have a void you can pour into or you can also hollow out from the outside contours and make a hollow mold. You're gonna use a lot less material that way when you're printing, but sometimes if it's uh, heavy or it's, it's hard to hold up right, um, you might not be able to use that. So it's more you know, your own user preference and you know, what the model is gonna look like. And then printing, obviously, like I said, we use you know, the binder jenning printer whatever's on the inside of your mold is what's gonna be on the outside of your model. So you wanna make sure you're gonna sand down your layer lines and make sure it's a nice smooth surface. You're not gonna, you're not gonna make it look like a 3D printed model. And then yes, yeah, sometimes you can use uh, release agents as well to make sure that silicone comes out. Juan went into a uh, pretty good detail about this as well. So mixing and pouring, we usually use one-to-one -one ratios. It's super easy. Pour one thing, put some color in, pour the same amount of the other thing, mix it up put in, into a degassing chamber so that we can remove all that air. And then I like to use syringes um, to control the flow of uh, everything a little more. Once it's completely cured, you can remove that. We like to use some wedges for that. It helps, um, you're gonna have kind of a hard time getting that out the first time. And once you're done, we usually either CT or MRI each model to see what kind of layer lines look like. Um, it's a nice way to show uh, how much degassing you had as well because it'll show the air in there. Here's some quick examples of a uh, ventriculostomy trainer that we designed. So he's making a burr hole into this patient's skull, and then he's gonna be passing a catheter down into the fourth ventricle of a gelatin brain that uh, the ventricles are full of fluid so he can see where he's at. The biggest thing uh, with this model, the, the want for it was there isn't really a model on the market for this, and residents are practicing on patients. So we just wanted to try and um, get, get out of that area as fast as possible. So we have these for everyone. Um, another thing that we had to request on was an amniocentesis model. So you have an amniotic sac, you have a fetus inside, and it's ultrasoundable. Kind of uh, did a second version of that, which is a little more simplified and a little more realistic inside. So we have more of a realistic fetus that you can see a nice smooth globe to the outside. The bottom is a lot thicker silicone, so it self seals. You can fill it and, um, you know, fill it as many times as you want and it shouldn't leak. And then it's ultrasoundable. That last picture, you can kind of see the baby's face on. So that turned out really well. And then the last one, and it's our most recent model, is actually for um, our x ray students, and they're just learning skull positioning here in a month. So, skull positioning, I don't know if any of you know, is, is pretty difficult to learn as a student. And and see it very often. So we made sure the skull was um, exactly where it should be. 3D printed skull, 
molded into a patient's face um, anatomically correct so that when they are using the external landmarks for positioning, they can shoot an x-ray on that and see exactly what it should look like. And with that, I will pass this off to Pete. Okay, perfect. Um, so the first example I wanted to show is a, is a mandibular spacer example. Uh, this was done for a fast-acting osteomyelitis. Uh, we've done this twice, actually. Uh, one was of a graft and one was the native mandible. What they wanted was just a, a piece that they could stick in the section where that mandible section was removed or the graft was removed to hold that envelope, that tissue envelope open. Uh, but they also wanted to treat the infection. So what we decided to do was we decided to make a mold using a mirror image of that contralateral mandible. We mirror image it over and then created a mold of that section uh, so they could use that mold in the OR with their antibiotic impregnated PMMA, which is their bone cement. You can see on the uh, Panorex here that there's the drain and the uh, uh, PMMA section within the mandible. And then after however long they want to wait, when the infection's clear, they'll go in and remove this and proceed to place their graft. created them from molds. Uh, you can see there's different ways, like Sarah mentioned. The way I like to do a lot of my molds is the hollow feature or the box feature, but then you can also cut down the boxes or the hollow, depending how you want the mold. Um, below you see this mold. What we did for this particular um, case here, this was just on one of their phantoms that we were doing some research on. We actually hollowed to the outside, then we cut that area out we wanted to use for the offset. The nice part about that hollow is you can really control your layer thickness there. So you have the perfect, whether it's three millimeters or five millimeters layer thickness. If you're layering wax or another material, it's very hard when the contours get intricate to make it a nice uh, constant thickness. You can smooth out the edges and then you could either directly 3D print this or you could make a mold. You can see below that we made a mold for filling with wax. Wax is a good material because they want that material uh, really the same properties as uh, tissue for radiation oncology. So here we also, for the wax, we actually, we use this for silicone first, but we actually added some uh, fill holes and air holes to uh, pour the wax in. So with silicone, you could do this without those holes. Uh, for wax, you needed to add those holes. Uh, another technique you could do, this was an ear, and we wanted to make this out of silicone because you can't really make a perfect flexible offset with any of the 3D printing materials available. And if you could, those materials really can't handle tissue contact for a long period of time. Uh, here, we just put a sphere around this ear, and then we could create a box around that, do Boolean operations, so your 3D subtraction algorithms to subtract the face from your box and then subtract the sphere from your box and you have that ear. The nice part when you're doing a surface feature like the ear, you have those parting lines of that soft tissue. So you already have your parting lines created. You don't have to go try and add a plane or make a special cut for your parting lines. They're already there. And all you have to do is your 3D subtraction algorithms and addition algorithms or intersection algorithms. Here you can also take your model part and bring it back into your CT series and just look at it through the stack of your CT series. Totally switching gears, we've done some work with custom orthotics and this person had his toe fixed in an upright position. So it wasn't giving him the stability he required to stand or perform yoga. He was very active in yoga. So what we did is we actually took a handheld scanner and we scanned the cast that prosthetic made. Uh, if you look at the middle picture below, you can see that we broke off the other toes to scan the cast. We scanned that, we made a prototype just by using the hollow feature and a little freeform construction with some digital clay. 
From there, we made some other prototypes and different um, shore hardnesses of silicone. And we created multiple, basically, toe offsets for him. So this allowed him to practice his yoga again. Uh, what we found out is since this had to fit tight, we actually had to rescale this slightly down in the X, Y direction. So we, we really reduced that diameter so it would hug his toe when he was doing yoga. And then one morning, you know, we felt creative and we wanted to put a little Zen lion on the front of his toe for his uh, yoga experience. So we also do a lot of medical simulation there. And this is where we, uh, this was a, one of our first products with medical simulation. And they were using a foam face with a ping pong ball and gelatin over that to remove foreign bodies uh, from the eye. Uh, here we actually took the 3D scan from digital stereophotogrammetry and we created that soft tissue with a silicone mold. We 3D printed the eyes, 3D printed the base and they can actually attach this face to the slit lamp to actually flick out that foreign body for the first time on this simulator instead of on that real patient. That's one of the things Sarah mentioned too, that they can practice this on a simulator instead of for the first time on an actual patient. Uh, so this is just a diagram of the parts. And we switched from molding a little silicone lens to we actually dip these now in a re, re uh, moldable and reheatable ballistics gel. And that gives a little better feel to the eye. So here's the silicone mold, it's two piece and you just fill the one side and, and press it together. Again, here we use the binder jetting process. You can see the mold's pretty thick, but you want it pretty thick if you're going to be making multiple pieces. If you just have one, one piece you need, you can make that mold thin, uh, but it might break after that one press. We actually adapted this model too to create a lateral canthotomy model. Uh, so this is a lateral canthotomy model. We only needed half the face for this. So why go through the hassle of creating the whole silicone face? Uh, so we really cut that face in half. We added some holes, added some um, orbits there, and we strapped these gall strips through those holes to represent that lateral tendon. So they can actually cut the lateral canthus, cut that tendon, and you see that spring behind the eye in the first picture. That will push the eye forward. So the eye will be pushed forward after their procedure so they can practice this before the real thing. Other easy medical simulators we've done was an ultrasound model. Sarah's gone over that, but we did one for injections into the shoulder joint cavity. And we've also done, like Juan was discussing, some intestinal suturing uh, models. These on the market, they're, they're quite expensive for a little piece of silicone. So we can make this mold and uh, produce, we've produced over 100 now on these couple molds we have. Uh, so you might pay $300 to create these pieces for your mold. But when each of these uh, pieces you buy on the market may cost you $70, you can really show a cost savings. Uh, here's a little video I can play of the mold making procedure. So you'll basically clamp that mold together. There's some indices that hold it in the proper position. Instead of clamps for this mold, we just created some ABS little pieces. And then you would fill that little channel with silicone and use this plunger type device to create the lumen. Uh, what, what was interesting here is we realized it was better to create those rib features on the outside uh, and that a uh, plunger feature as a flat, smooth piece. So then we just flip that inside out. You can use some extrinsic silicone and color the outside in red if you would like. A uh, few other resources here that might explain some of the processes more in depth. Uh, so we did an article on the custom spacer and the low cost simulator for medical training for the ocular form body. So with that all being said, I think we'll turn it over and see if there's any quick questions. I know we're right at three o'clock, but we will check the chat for any quick questions. I have been replying uh, via the text uh, aspects of the Q&A to some of them. But, uh, 
willing to answer any questions if anyone. Let me see. Okay, so Juan, you've already answered quite a few of these. Uh, one says, the one, there's one about are we ordering all your parts in the electronic health record. For the simulators, we're not. And, and we actually have our own system for uh, our records. We don't have this within the hospital's electronic health record yet. Uh, Juan or Sarah, what about you? Do you have this in your electronic health record? No, just like you, Pete, um, we don't do them for the simulation models just because they're, um, they're supposed to be a random patient so that you know, you can keep using this. It's not like a one-off for that patient's specific procedure. Yeah, for the facial prosthetics, that is uh, documented within the electron electronic patient record. Uh, these are considered durable medical equipment and they require a medical record for billing purposes. All right, so I know we're over right now. So first of all, I wanna thank Sarah and Juan for coming on today to explain a little bit about silicone molding and casting and multiple materials. Uh, in conclusion, I wanna thank RSNA for allowing us to do this session, the leadership committee for helping me put this together. And, and thanks again to our presenters for educating the audience. Uh, Please continue to stay safe and healthy. And if you like this sort of how-to uh, webinars, please tell us on the SIG website in the comments. Thanks for attending. Bye. Thanks to Pete too. Bye. -bye.